I want to welcome everyone back to another episode of the Old Glory Club. I'm happy to have Tom Woods with us today. How are you doing, Tom? Doing great, Pete. Thanks for having me. Tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Uh, you're, this, this might be a new environment for you. So, yeah. Well, I have uh, the, the credentials I have are the kinds of credentials that will make people want to turn this off, unfortunately. But <laughs> especially with all that's been going on with Harvard, with the uh, recent Supreme Court decision, I'm just more and more ashamed to say that I graduated from there, <laughs> but I did. I, I mean, and by the way, we got an email, all the alumni, we got an email it. yeah, <laughs> saying, uh, you know, oh, what a terrible day this is. And, and I actually, you can reply to that email. And I replied and said, why are you treating us all as subhuman if we disagree? I, I think it's a great day. You know, why do you just automatically assume all, all the alumni agree with you? Uh, I think it's a great day. And then they also said in the email, I, I'm sorry, it's a very roundabout way of introducing myself. That's but they also, they also said in the email that no aspect of us, of what makes us who we are, is irrelevant. You know, so in other words, race can't be irrelevant. So, so I said, well, great. I can't wait to see your special recruitment drive for traditionalist Catholics, you know, because that's a big part of what makes them who they are. And they have a completely marginalized perspective. And I know you love those. So let me know how that goes. And <laughs> they don't respond to me. They should drop me from the list, but they don't. Anyway, so I went there. Then I have a PhD from Columbia. So the two institutions that have destroyed America, I, I, I elbowed my way in one way or another. But um, I kind of put myself on the map, not with my first couple of books, uh, one of which was rather academic. But in uh, late 2004, I wrote The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, which is coming up on its 20th anniversary. And I may do a uh, up to, you know, bring it up to date chapter because a lot's happened in the past 20 years, Pete. That'd be great. <laughs> you know? So anyway, so that but that book really put me on the map. Uh, New York Times bestseller for 12 weeks. People loved it or hated it. All the bad guys hated it. And and I mean bad guys, you know, not like the obvious, like the New York Times. They didn't like it. But let's just say certain bad guys in, in my general wing, let's say. Um, but after that, I yeah, I wrote books for quite a while. I was at the Mises Institute as a senior fellow at resident in, scho uh, in uh, scholar in residence for four years. Um, but since then, I've had the Tom Woods Show, which is my podcast that's been running about 10 years, had couple thousand episodes of that. And I, um, I keep busy doing a lot of things. I, I, I helped to create the Ron Paul homeschool curriculum. Uh, and I, let's just say I keep busy. Yep. Yes, you certainly do. Um, wouldn't it be nice to have an alma mater that you'd want to send money to and support? <laughs> I know it's, I know, I know it. I mean, and the thing is they, I got, I got a decent amount of financial aid. They don't have academic based aid. Uh, they, they just, help you out depending on your income. And I came from a modest middle-class background. And so they footed a lot of the bill and, you know, being not a parasite, I kind of feel bad about that in a way. Like I would like to, to, to make good on that, but I just can't. I mean, if they're, if they're going to be at war with me, then they deserve to be stuck with the bill. <laughs> well, I, they have, it seems like they have a pretty good war chest from what I've heard. Oh, do they ever? Do yeah. they ever? They don't. I mean, Ron Unz says that they could easily get by not charging any tuition whatsoever. They yeah. actually could. That's how big it is. Yeah. All right. Well, one of those books you wrote, and uh, the guys here at OGC wanted to do a um, episode on nullification. So, I mean, who else? Stephen Carson's one of the uh, OGC guys. So you know, I'm sure he was. I'm sure he was the one who was like um, Woods. Yeah, Woods. Um, did he's he been a big, he's been a good friend. Did he edit, has he ever edited anything that you wrote? <laughs> he might, it's possible he did a, uh, like a, a proofread of something that I did as I yeah. think back on it, but it's been a long time. Yeah. Um, actually interviewing him in a couple hours, but you wrote a book called nullification. nullification. Yeah. And, uh, it's a book I have, I don't have it here. It's at the new house or else I would hold, I would hold it up. <laughs> I'm going to hold it up. Wait a <laughs> there we go. Yep. There it is. Nullification. Yep. I oh. have a, yeah, I have a copy of that myself. I have read it actually. Good. And yeah, <laughs> well, nullification, when people hear nullification, in especially in today's environment, it means 
a lot of things, um, but usually it's portrayed as something negative. Um, why don't yeah. you tell people what nullification is? Well, first of all, here's what it isn't. It's not jury nullification. That's a separate issue. You can have another conversation about that. This is state nullification. This is the idea that a state should not only refuse to enforce, but perhaps even actively thwart the enforcement of an unconstitutional law within their borders. So that's what it's all about. So you hear that, and you've been trained to think this must be evil, because we all know that smaller political units are, are evil, and big centralized regimes are good. And the small the smaller units are always trying to exert their powers for disreputable purposes. And thankfully, according to the progressive version of history, we have these centralized regimes that come in and smack them down when they try to do this. Well, it's almost impossible to have a conversation when people have that background. And, you know, one of my favorite memories about all this, actually, Pete, comes from I was invited to speak at the Yale Political Union, where there's some controversial issue that you're going to come defend against all comers. And that means that students can come up and speak on behalf of what you've said or against what you've said. So I actually went to Yale and argued for the right of a state to secede from the union. Now, that's different from nullification, but it's, it, it, it follows the same kind of principle, that the state has an existence of its own. It's not just an administrative unit of the central government. And it was so interesting to hear these elite students get up there and try to lecture me with like a third grade level lecture about racism and slavery because they thought those magic words will just shut me up. And I just murdered them, Pete. But I murdered them with a smile on my face and jokes coming out of my mouth. And I charmed the whole room. And I ended up winning the point two to one in an audience of Yale students, I won the point two to one that state should have the right to secede. <laughs> you think that would happen now? I wonder. I, I might have to pack that audience to get that result now. <laughs> I'm not so sure. But on the other hand, I think it might, if I framed it a little differently, I think there's a possibility that playing to that audience, I could say, look, you guys are all sick and tired of dealing with backwoods hicks in your view, right? They don't want the national health care that you want, and they don't want this and that, but you could have that tomorrow. You could have it tomorrow. You know, and maybe there are enough of them who might be swept away by, by my manipulative appeal. <laughs> <laughs> so nullification, um, is it written into the constitution? Where is it? Uh, where does the idea come from? Okay. So it's not in the constitution, but on the other hand, we should remember that pretty much almost nothing that we have the right to do is written in the constitution. There's nothing saying you have the right to have a family. You know, there's nothing <laughs> that says you have the right to have, uh, well, I, I was going to say a certain number of people at your funeral, but as we've seen, <laughs> apparently you don't have that right. But the, the idea of the constitution is that it lists the things the, the government can do. It doesn't list the things we can do because that list would go on forever. The presumption is that you can do things. And so, but whereas the government does not have that presumption. So the Tenth Amendment more or less says that anything that's not mentioned in here, we presume, rests with the states and the people. That's the arrangement. So nullification, in fact, is embedded in the very nature of the union. That's, that's more or less the argument. So Thomas Jefferson's view was spelled out nowhere better than in the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798 and the somewhat, maybe even slightly more radical uh, uh, Kentucky Resolutions of 1799. Now, those came out right around the time of the death of George Washington. So they were mostly overlooked because of that. But all the same, the gist of Jefferson's argument was, we have this federal government. It's, it's, these are all things we've all heard a million times. But just what's interesting is the conclusion Jefferson draws from it. We have this federal government with enumerated powers. It has only the powers delegated to it. And the Tenth Amendment says that the states retain and the people everything else. But then Jefferson goes to the next point. Well, that's not self-enforcing. You know, I mean, there aren't fangs that come out of the Constitution if the federal government goes beyond what it's allowed to do. So how do we keep this kind of equilibrium between the states and the federal government so that one doesn't swallow up the other? And the answer is, well, this, there has to be enforcement teeth for the Tenth Amendment. And that comes with the states. And why? Because they are the parties to the Constitution. The United States is not just one undifferentiated mass of individuals. 
it is made up of constituent parts. It's made up of individual societies, namely the states. And we know that because of the way it was ratified. It was not ratified in one single national vote of, end quote, American people. They're, strictly speaking, I mean, John C. Calhoun was the one who had the guts to come out and say it. He actually came out and said, there is no such thing as the American people. We have the people of Massachusetts. We have the people of Virginia. We have the people of South Carolina. We have the people of Pennsylvania. There is no American people. That's just an invention. So what follows from this is that the states who created the Constitution, it's not right to say that the Constitution is a contract between the federal government and the states. That's not correct, because how could the federal government enter, enter, enter into a contract that created itself? It wasn't in existence at that point. So instead, the Constitution is a compact among the states creating a federal government. So Dr. Frankenstein, in principle, has authority over the Frankenstein monster because he's the creator. And likewise, the states have to have control over this federal government. Now, James Madison even said in the Virginia report of 1800 that we can't assume that we have two fallible branches of the federal government and then one infallible one, namely the judiciary, that, oh, don't worry, the judiciary will solve this. If the federal government goes too far, don't worry, the courts will step in. But you know what? What if they don't? What if all three branches gang up on the public? I mean, we, we offer this to you, Pete, as a hypothetical situation. But what if all three branches gang up on the people? Then what do we do then? Well, then in the last resort, it's up to the creators of the union to step in and say, we can't allow this because we never gave you the power to do it. Any other approach to this question assumes that the federal government has a monopoly on interpreting what its powers are. But we can obviously tell what would happen if it had such a monopoly. It will interpret every controversy in its own favor because there's nobody available to say no to it. So that's in effect, um, that's more or less the thinking behind it. You mentioned the 10th Amendment, Tom. Um, sometimes when you mention the 10th Amendment, when you say the phrase states' rights, you will have people jump in and go, well, states don't have any rights because they're not individuals. Only individuals have rights. How do you answer that? First, like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, Jefferson used the term. So I'm pretty sure he knew what was meant by it. Uh, I'm, I'm sure he would not say states have rights per se. What he means by that is that he's just using a shorthand term to refer to the relationship between the states and the federal government. That's all he means, that if the federal government is not delegated a certain power, then the power is reserved by the states. That is to say, if the federal government tried to wrench it away from the state, then that would be the, the federal government would be perpetrating a wrong against the state. Because in our constitutional system, the state retains power over whatever that issue is. Now, we may then go further and say, I don't even want the states to have this power. Well, that's correct, too. But the states have their own existences. They have their own state constitutions and bills of rights. And they have their own. Um, they're, they're not absorbed into the federal government. That is all he's saying, that there are some matters, in fact, most matters, that are beyond the power of the federal government to, to carry out. And if the federal government carries them out, then they are violating the rights of the states. And again, all that means, and, and the thing is, most of the people saying this are not ANCAPs. So they don't actually believe that no state has the power to do anything. Most of them are, are minarchists or bigger government people. So if they think that some level of government has the power to uh, you know, have a police force or something, well, if the federal government federalized the police force, that would be violating the rights of the states. That, that, that's basically what's meant. Okay. So you mentioned, I think it was that the Virginia resolution was uh, more uh, radical. What was the... Oh, what, no, what, uh, the, 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 19, the 1799 Kentucky resolution oh, the was a little bit okay. more radical than the 1798 one. Okay. So and what was what was it about? The, 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 the only major difference is that there was a clarification in 1799 in which the word nullification was actually used in 1799. 
1798, Jefferson had included that word, but one of his friends advised against its use, thinking that it would just make people go berserk and you're, you're, you know it's, it's going to be more trouble than it's worth. So he got rid of it. But in 1799, it's in there, the word nullification. And it's it, it, this, this is an interesting point because in later years, James Madison tried to obscure the nature of what had gone on during those years because Madison had grown more nationalistic over time. And he didn't want to be associated with nullification, even though he'd been the principal drafter of the Virginia Resolution, 1798. Now, those had used the term interposition, which to, to my mind is still tomato tomato, because interposition refers to a state standing in between the federal government and the people to prevent an unconstitutional law from being carried out. Well, that sorry, that sounds like nullification to me. You know, maybe the word isn't as arresting, I suppose, but it sounds like nullification to me. In fact, when Daniel Webster during the War of 1812 said that if the federal government tries to engage in, in military conscription, this would be a grotesque violation of the Constitution. This is the nationalist Daniel Webster, by the way, who in the webster hayne debates uh, in 1830 was arguing for the, the single consolidated union. Even he said the federal government cannot do that, and it would be up to the states to interpose their authority to prevent that being carried out. Well, again, that to me, that sounds like nullification. But Madison tried to obscure this and play with words. And then he tried to claim that and this is back. This is like in the 1830s. He's getting old. Uh, and and the, the we've you know, we'll get to this later. There was a nullification controversy going on then. And he's trying to say, I we had nothing to do with this. Jefferson had nothing to do with this. Jefferson never used the word nullification. That's what he tried to say. And then a copy of the of the Kentucky Resolutions of 1799 in Jefferson's own handwriting was presented to him. Well, there it is, you lying SOP. There it is. So that is why it matters that that word, for some reason, was like radioactive. And so to have Jefferson actually have uttered it makes it a little easier to get away with saying it today. Well, let's. one of the things that we do here most of the time is we usually pick a subject go a little bit with it, um, get the gist of it, and then we just start going off on rabbit trails. But before we start going off on rabbit trails, um, talk a little bit about the 1832. Um, this one is actually called a crisis when, yeah. you, when you look it up in history. So this, this goes back to the issue of the South and protective tariffs. And the long and the short of it is that, that the Southern states felt like the protective tariff was a uh, a benefit only to the North and not to them. And it only hurt them. And so there was an argument advanced. Now this, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not entirely convinced that they're right, but at the very least they had a case uh, for it, which was they argued that what they called the tariff of abominations uh, was, which was a, a very recently uh, enacted tariff uh, that that was giving them no relief from what they'd been suffering for some time was really the last straw. But but beyond that, actually unconstitutional. Now, OK, how could they say that? Obviously, the Constitution authorizes the the levying of tariffs. But their argument was that the purpose of of tariffs um, is is supposed to be as a revenue device. And secondly, we have that the the uh, constitution twice referring to the general welfare that the federal government's actions need to be aimed at bringing about the general welfare well, so they argued against the protective tariff on both of these grounds they said number one the protective tariff is not intended to bring in revenue i mean obviously like if if we were to put a 200% uh tariff on imported cars we wouldn't start licking our chops at how rich the government was going to get from that, nobody would buy those cars. So it's the purpose of that is something other than the raising of revenue. So number one, they, they said it's not clear that that's what the Constitution had in mind when it talked about uh, levying tariffs. But secondly, obviously, this is a measure that does not benefit the general welfare. It benefits one section of the country at the expense of another. So they tried to argue that it was unconstitutional. And therefore, they were going to try to to actively thwart its enforcement. Now, you can you can talk about uh, freedom of speech in the 1790s, which is what nullification was first devised to defend. It was devised as a 
defense mechanism against the Alien and Sedition Acts, which were offenses against the freedom of speech. Uh, you can talk about that, and you can have that conversation, and you can talk about this, that, or the other thing, uh, you know, unconstitutional searches and seizures. These are a number of issues that nullification had been threatened over. But if you start talking about cutting off the tariffs, now that's just, yeah, now we're just not doing that. So that led to a showdown with Andrew Jackson. Now, Andrew Jackson was good on some things and bad on others, and he was bad on this. And so there was a force bill that authorized the federal government to go in and use force if, if the nullification was ever actually really carried out. Um, now, Calhoun was who eventually he was replaced as, as vice president, became Martin Van Buren, but he was the vice president. And he eventually went back into the U.S. Senate and he was arguing in favor of the nullification. And his approach was... Um, he was very specific as to exactly how nullification would be carried out. He felt like something that's so grave as this should be carried out in a way that's analogous to how the ratification of the Constitution was carried out. Well, how was that carried out? The states held ratifying conventions. And in Republican theory of that time, the, the, the convention, the specially called convention, was considered to be the instrument through which the voice of the people was most reliably heard, the convention, the specially elected convention. So we would have a nullification convention, just like we had for ratifying the Constitution. And his view was that if even one state doesn't have to be a majority, doesn't have to be a significant minority, if even one state says that a federal measure is unconstitutional, then that measure should be considered as suspended until we resolve this matter. And we resolve this matter by, dis by discussing it, by um, either, uh, so let's say, let's say there is some constitutionally ambiguous thing and one or a number of states said, we refuse to enforce this because of its dubious constitutionality. One way out of that would be to amend the constitution to either clearly grant or clearly prohibit uh, the exercise of this power by the federal government. And then at that point, the side that loses can decide, can you live with this new arrangement now where it's been clarified, or you can secede from the union if this is just a step too far. That was how he envisioned it being carried out. So eventually what happened is that Henry Clay uh, stepped in and worked out a kind of a compromise whereby the, the tariff would be lowered to bring about relief for the South, but it would be lowered gradually over time so as to give the North time to adjust to the new arrangement. And that more or less uh, brought an end to it. Mm. Can you give examples of how nullification was used successfully um, back then? How, you know, when it, when it didn't become a, uh, when it wasn't a national you know, emergency or tragedy, as some people would call it? What I think it generally did was remind the federal government that if it presses too hard, it might wind up in a battle it can't win. And so it, I think in a way it averted crises when the, when the states would say, uh, we're considering nullifying this. So the states interfered or, or the New England states were afraid that Jefferson's embargo, which was fruitless, that, that he enacted to try to get the British and French to stop interfering with American trade, they felt like his approach to that uh, would make the situation even worse. Uh, and so there was talk about uh, nullifying that. And eventually, Madison, you know, they, they tried every combination of what we're going to carry it. We're going to try this policy, that policy, that policy. Uh, I think it, it, maybe it's possible they didn't try military conscription because one of the best known um, members of the U.S. Congress stood up and said, if you try that, we're going to fight you every step of the way. We're going to resist you. Well, you know, in, the, in, the, in that day and age, there was no doubt that they would have done it. You know, today you wonder, well, most people don't know any American history, so they'll probably think it's treason to engage in nullification. But in that, in that time, I don't think they doubted that that could actually be carried out. Uh, or, um, I think the nullification in the case of 1798 over the Alien Sedition Acts, I think it brought national attention to those issues. 
And I don't think it's a coincidence that Jefferson was then elected president in 1800. And then he um, released everybody who had been um, incarcerated over that. And he refunded everybody's fines that they had had to pay with interest. So I think it also accomplished that. Now, also, it, it had the very the salutary effect of revealing to the country that the New England states were against Virginia and Kentucky nullifying the Alien Sedition Acts, not because they thought nullification was unconstitutional or all this, uh, you know, high horse nonsense, but in I believe there were so so uh, Virginia and Kentucky issued their resolutions, and then a number of states it was it was seven or eight states uh, issued their own responses to Virginia and Kentucky, and in those responses, all but one of those states came out and actively endorsed the Alien and Sedition Acts. So the real reason they were against Virginia and Kentucky nullifying them is that they thought it was just fine to imprison you for criticizing John Adams. They wanted to do it. So then when you look at it, because you know, if you read in your textbook, and, and these bastards have done this in basically every American textbook, it says Virginia and Kentucky failed to get any other state to side with them. Well, you know what? Let's look at that more closely. Why didn't they side with them? Because they wanted to throw you in jail for criticizing John Adams. Did you forget to put that in the textbook? Because that might make that side of the argument a little more dishonorable. So therefore, it's not even in there. Now, it doesn't surprise me. At this point, I am so utterly unimpressed with American historians. It wouldn't surprise me if none of them even know that. If none of them even bothered to look at what the other states were saying. They were all cheering for this. Hmm. Well... Would you say that the war is what basically, um, I mean, how much nullification happened after the war or even threats of it? It's after the war, it seems like the, the federalization, um, you know, the, the, the unionization, the, uh, the, you know, these United States becoming the United States was just sealed. And, um, now it would become, you know, if you do that, your slavery is going to be thrown in your face. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So it's you don't see it much. I mean, you do you do see some um, half-hearted efforts at the time of forced integration, basically. But you know that didn't really go anywhere. So yeah, so it it basically fell more or less into disuse. But the argument is that the the points we make about it are still the same. They were never refuted. You don't refute arguments through violence. So if you know if your if your kid gets beaten up at the park, you don't say to your kid, "Well, I guess you were wrong." You know, what would a, that would be a deranged thing to say? We'd never think that way. You know, or, or, or you know, if if Stalin had had uh, you know, in Stalin's forces, let's say, had had somehow uh, invaded South Korea and been victorious, we wouldn't have said, "Well." Guess the South Koreans had it coming to them. I mean, this is this is not the way we think in any other situation. But in this case, because of the propaganda, you get people saying, "Well, we fought a war over that." What are you talking about? First of all, we didn't fight a war over nullification. Uh, secondly, t Jefferson Davis, um, in his farewell address to the Senate, criticized nullification because he thought the North was misusing it uh, when it came to the fugitive slave law. So, like, it's all it's all a, a whole lot of confusion, but. The, the union is still like the, the states never acceded to any change in the definition of the union. Uh, yeah, they got um, they got reconstruction and they got all kinds of in, incoherent constitutional doctrines thrown at them, but they've never been asked to ratify a different constitution. So if the arguments were good, then they're still good today. And and also it's worth noting that if you look at I mean, it, it, it's important to contextualize documents from let's say from the 18th century like what was like if people for example a lot of times people will say the uh the 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 um th they talk about they say that the 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 union is a perpetual union and they 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 speak about this language they say that uh th there were references to the the uh, constitution being perpetual and the union being perpetual but perpetual in the 18th century didn't mean lasting forever, because if that were true, then we'd still have the Articles of Confederation, because that was called the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union. All it meant was there was no built-in sunset provision. That's all that meant. So when you, it's important to, to be precise with language. Well, the reason I bring this up is 
1758, there was a, a, a extremely influential international lawyer named Emmerich de Vattel, who said that if, if a sovereign state joins a confederation, it does not yield the powers that it had when it was a sovereign state outside the confederation. It may simply choose not to exercise those powers for a particular period of time for, for some greater purpose, but it doesn't lose its sovereignty. It's always sovereign. The people of that state are always sovereign. So the mere fact that you join a union does not compromise the, the fullness of your sovereignty. If that confederation that you join exercises certain powers, they exercise those powers at your sufferance. Okay, that's that's not because they inherently have them. So given that, well, again, nothing has changed. What we had was the peoples of all these states acceding to uh, the Constitution. So they're just as sovereign as they ever were, according to the international lawyers at the time of the, that the Constitution was ratified. And since there's been no official change, nothing's been ratified to the contrary since then then the arguments still are good. And, and telling me that they were defeated in war is not an argument. I mean, that, that shows they don't, even know, they don't even know how to debate you. Well, let's bring this all the way forward to today. So, I mean, I think I asked you to come on uh, the show, my show back in like March of 2020 to talk about nullification because, you know, we, I think we both saw what was coming. And, um, so since 2020, um, you know, the state you live in and other states have seemed to have embraced it again, um, at least in the spirit of it when it comes, yeah. when it came to, you know, well, definitely COVID. So yeah. um, how did you see, we're, I mean, I think both of us were like, when we did that show, we were like, if you would have told us in January that in March we were going to be talking about federalism, uh, <laughs> federalism becoming a thing, we you, know, you would have told you you were yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah. I have to say, I mean, that was even though that whole COVID period was a huge black uh, black pill, the white pill part of it was that we discovered that if we ever really do want to have federalism again, it's just sitting there waiting for us. Uh, the problem was we didn't have enough people who wanted their governors to release their shackles. They wanted to be shackled. But there were a couple of them who were pretty good. Now, most Republicans were as useless as they always are. But I will say, despite what people think about Ron DeSantis today, I mean, I, I still think he, he did a really a lot of really important things. And he well, let me inter let me interrupt you because yeah. it's funny because we were talking about this before we we started May 1st, 2020. We had lunch in Atlanta. Yeah. Do you remember why we had lunch? We because had lunch we couldn't have it in Florida. Yep. <laughs> you still, it was takeout only in Florida. So yeah. I had to drive to, and, and the reason I saw you uh, at that lunch, the reason I was up there was that as soon as Georgia opened, my, my well, I guess we weren't married just yet, but we were, yeah, but we were together at least. And, and we just said, we got to get out of here. We got to go eat at a restaurant somewhere. So we drove up to Georgia. <laughs> and so while we were there, we said, eh, what the heck? And I remember actually I had lunch at a sandwich shop while I was up there, I took a picture of my sandwich. I posted it to Twitter and I believe it is the most liked and retweeted tweet I've ever had. It was a sandwich, Pete. <laughs> it was a sandwich. Well, when we put, we, we took a picture at the table. Um, and when I put that out on Facebook, I mean, people were like, where the, where is this happening? <laughs> <laughs> I know it. I know it. I know. It. So, I mean, it, it's interesting though, that DeSantis, elevated some of the very voices that we now know were being actively suppressed. Mm -hmm. And then the day before he said, all right, it's phase whatever, which is every restriction is lifted. The day before that, he had a round table with Bhattacharya and all the usual names. And they were all saying, yeah, you got to do this. There's no reason to have these restrictions. I knew why he was doing that. He was preparing the way so that he could say, look, you know, these super credential people say it. What I didn't know was it was going to be the next day. He covered his ass with that event and then the next day. And so I, I know there are people who are nitpicking him now or they're saying, you know, and I, I know he's got baggage, believe me. But the thing is, it is hard for me as a father of five daughters living in Florida not to appreciate the fact that their lives weren't ruined and they weren't traumatized by crazy, insane BS. 
you know, and and so that did go to show what uh, federalism could do. But remember, there were rumors coming out of the Biden White House that they were and, and rumors don't come out by accident. Like these are trial balloons. And there was a rumor that they were considering restricting travel to Florida because it was just too dangerous for people to go there. And I remember thinking that would be out of this world crazy. And DeSantis said that now I don't know what would happen in the actual event, but he said that he would defy that. Like there was just no way he would let that happen. And I remember thinking this would be a fascinating constitutional showdown to observe. We didn't get that, but, um, but yeah, we did see, um, and, but not only with COVID, I do want to say a word on behalf of somebody I've, uh, been good friends with for a long time. And that's Michael Bolden from the 10th Amendment Center. I mean, Michael Bolden started the 10th Amendment Center during the George W. Bush years when, uh, you know, the, the, the conservative movement, if, you know, whatever you want to call it, call it the losers, the last thing in the world they wanted to hear was defying the federal government. What? One of our people is in there. Like, what? And so then when he was still doing this in under Obama, the, the left-wingers would say, oh, I bet you weren't doing this under George W. Bush. He'd say, yeah, I, I was, because I this is what I believe in. I, I don't want this regime uh, micromanaging the, the, the whole country. But w the 10th Amendment Center has a, I don't know, I mean, 10th Amendment Center doesn't sound super confrontational, but it's dedicated to nullification. That really is what it is. And they have model legislation. And it's not all uh, taking the form of, we absolutely defy you. Sometimes it's it's lesser um, things like, uh, well, sometimes it is defy you. Like bef before Trump did it, there were states that were passing a right to try law that if there's an experimental drug and you're going to die anyway and you want to see if it works, you should be able to see if it works. You know, and so some states just went ahead and did that. Um, obviously, the the marijuana thing, just some states just went ahead and did. And technically, they're not allowed to do that. They just went ahead and did that. Um, there have been a number of of other issues like the um, the defend the guard bill, which, you know, in which states are going to recall their national guards uh, back to their state if they're engaged in wars that are undeclared. Um, there was his, um, Michael's friend, um, Mike Meharry, who's the communications director of the 10th Amendment Center, uh, who's very concerned about NSA surveillance and so on. I mean, you have to assume part of the reason that some of these people in Congress are so feckless is that they've got something on them. I mean, you just have to figure that <laughs> nobody could be that spineless. So it's a concern. These things are a concern. So the main facility is in, is in Utah. And so Mike came up with the idea. It turns out that they use water to cool their machinery. It's a very common thing, hmm. but they use, I mean, it's an astronomical amount of water that they need. And, and Meharry said, what if we shut the water off? What if, what if Utah just shuts off the water? There's no constitutional obligation for them to give water to anybody. And so they started the off now campaign. It did not succeed. But, but you think about all these right wing think, supposedly right wing think tanks that blow a hundred million bucks a year on God knows what they would never rally around something like that. Cause it's not respectable. Right? What, what will the New York times think? But here's a shoestring organization that got on CBS News talking about this strategy. So, I mean, just think, if we had people with some stones in any of these places, we might actually be getting somewhere. Yeah, no, 100%. Going forward, I mean, we, you know, we've talked about it. We, uh, a couple months ago, watched and commented on um, Pat, uh, Pat Buchanan's culture, culture war speech from 1992. And you know, we're looking at this culture war now that basically seems to be consuming all. And people may not want to believe this because, you know, I hear a lot of people say, you know, we really should be concentrating on the wars. We should be concentrating on what's going on overseas. It seems like a lot of this is pushing it overseas as well, that this has something to do. I mean, why would there be a George Floyd mural in Kabul? Why would there, why would they be teaching, um, you know, women's studies to Afghani girls, if that wasn't, if this wasn't a whole, a part of it, um, going forward, when you look at this and with the trans insanity, 
how do you see this playing out? Do you see that nullification can be um, something? And you know, <laughs> what do you see as the likelihood in our lifetime that we're going to see a state just go, you know what? Bye. We're done with this. You know, it's funny, Pete, that calls to mind exactly what you just said a minute ago, that in January of 2020, we couldn't have predicted what we were going to be talking about in March of 2020, <laughs> you know? And then secondly, I couldn't have predicted that the that the Bud Light uh, boycott would have been successful because there are so many of these boycotts that just fizzle out. And that happened. Um, I think there is uh, there's a backlash, I think, you know, beneath the surface because not it's not anybody famous involved in it. It's just regular people. There's a backlash against some of the craziness that's building. I saw a poll recently saying that, um, and I don't know what this term means to people, but that social conservatism was growing to like its highest level in, I don't know, 15 years. I forget what the thing was. Um, and I think that's entirely in reaction to what they're saying. I don't think maybe a, a, these, these people are probably not all Bishop Fulton Sheen exactly. But but they feel like what they're seeing today is just way too much. Well, well you know, it's interesting. I was talking with my friend Jacob the other day, and he he's saying because he's younger, and he's saying he's seeing it in the Zoomers. It's the it's the young people who are rebelling against this. Um, and you know what's funny is when I look at like the people who follow me on Twitter, so many of them are really really young, and it's. Yeah, that gives me hope. Now, you know, of course, those are people in their 20s, and we're looking at people in their teens who are just falling, you know, absolute victim to this, uh, this insanity, this new religion that the government has, uh, has declared. But if the people, if the people in their 20s, if the ones that can get elected in, you know, pretty soon to office are, embracing social conservative conservatism at least that's something to, to hold on to yeah i mean and and again even by social conservatism um if it just means they reject uh fact-free gender theory i'll take that <laughs> you know we'll work on other issues later i'll take that and 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 really if as long as it just means uh, and you know i know pete i get your thing about you know, as people who say mind your own business are always going to lose to people who just want to, you know, ram things down people's throats. But I think the people ramming the things down people's throats are, are, are starting to hit some resistance to that. And I think there are people who ordinarily wouldn't even want to be involved in anything like this. Like, I don't have time for this. This is stupid. Why am I wasting my time on this? But the answer is because I have no choice at this point. Um, I, I think there is, um, at the very least, a growing number of people who are who ju who do want to be left alone, but they don't mean that in some wimpy, non-judgmental way. It's I specifically want to be left alone by you, crazy people, and and you know just try. And in fact, did you see the videos the other day from? I, I'm sorry, I don't remember what state it was, but there was some school district where they were going to teach crazy nonsense to kids. Yeah. And there was a huge protest and it was probably three quarters immigrant, like yes. three quarters non-whites who, uh, you know, the progressives didn't quite count on this, that the, the people they're admitting uh, haven't all taken uh, Professor so-and-so's gender studies course. And they have this crazy idea that maybe they should have some say about what their kids learn. Uh, well, that kind of turned out a little bit differently from how they thought. Yeah, I saw a protest in Canada where it was a, a bunch of Muslims who were protesting this as well. Yeah. And they, they were coming out and they're like, no, we're not, we're not going to put up with this. I'm and surprised this took this long. I, I really couldn't understand how the left could be so pro Islam and not acknowledge that Islam is a worldview that is utterly opposed to yours in every particular. They're illiberal. I mean, they're, they're illiberal. I mean, they're not liberal. I mean, they're, yeah. yeah. They don't talk about universal human rights. No, <laughs> no. And, you know, that's, you know, some people might argue that's a little bit of people who aren't talking about that and who don't believe in that and a little bit of what needs to be in these people, fa people's faces right now um, so that they can be, have a little bit of fear. Yeah. That's the thing is they, they present themselves as not having any fear because 
their people are in charge. You know, so as soon as they meet somebody, you know, who is like, I'm not apologizing for what I believe. Yeah. Your words don't affect me. Yeah. You can call me X and Y, but that doesn't mean anything to me. These yeah. words are meaningless. And anybody whose opinion I care about knows these words are meaningless. Like it, do, it does not matter. If you're called a racist today, that doesn't even matter anymore. There yeah. was a time when that might have hurt you, but that does not matter. I mean, yeah, okay. If you're trying to get a job in academia and they do a search for you and everything says you're a racist, yeah, okay. But, you know, academia is different. A at this point, there's a huge number of Americans who just roll their eyes and say, okay, so you're just a normal person then. Yeah. yeah I mean, you're just a normal person who, by the way, has nothing but goodwill toward other people, wants, wants everyone in the world to be happy and successful, J just doesn't want to be propagandized 24 hours a day. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's also one of those things where it's really, really online. You know, I mean, you know where I live. You used to live where I live. I mean, you would expect to see it here. And it's like the fir for the first time the other day, I saw a woman in like Kroger um, who had a shirt that said read banned books. And I mean, she wasn't talking about like the kind of books that, you know, you write <laughs> or, you know, they, they, they want to ban uh, that you write or that, you know, that I, I, we might have in our secret library. But she's talking about, oh, these books about CRT, they're being taken out of uh, um primary school libraries it's so it's not real life it's not you know maybe it oh, is by the way these are the libraries of schools where they don't teach crt remember remember that yeah, yeah. they don't they don't actually yeah. teach it <laughs> however put our books back <laughs> okay yeah. but yeah, when you go to big cities you might see this you know but i mean i don't live in a big city anymore wherever i go i'm not seeing this you don't see this in real life this is Social media, which is, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the tool of wh where whoever comes up with these these memes, these memetics that they want to go out about trans people and about trans tra trans suicide, trans genocide, or trans genocide, all these things are created. But once you get out into the real world and you start talking to people, that just disappears. So you know, I've been trying to spend a whole lot more time offline lately. <laughs> Yeah, I know. You know, I, I've really given thought over the past few years to something I'm sure you've also thought of, but I, I didn't think of it until just a few years ago, which is on net, maybe my life is worse with social media. Now, I know that almost sounds so oh, naive, absolutely. like, Tom, how could yeah, we all know absolutely. that? But that was hard for me to see because on the surface, you would think like with something like Facebook, I genuinely enjoy keeping up with what some of my old friends from high school are up to. You know, like if it was just that, there's obviously no harm in that. But but then but Twitter Twitter is not really where you keep up with friends from high school. No. That's not that's not what it's for. People aren't really share, sharing family photos and stuff that much. So instead, it's like constant agitation, constant agitation, and being reminded constantly of how dumb so many people are and how unreachable they are. And I'm only on there because, you know, I mean, I would be crazy not to promote what I'm doing, given that. I, you know, I don't have my own show on television, so I got to use what I've got. But a lot of times I, I, I try to use my Twitter feed to get ideas for my newsletter. And the problem is that even though I've curated my Twitter feed pretty well to be only good people, sometimes my good people are arguing with bad people. So I see the arguments and I get drawn in and I don't want to. Be, I'm just trying to find ideas for my newsletter. You know, so it, it's it's incredible to me because if you were to describe it in the abstract and say, here's a way people from all over the world can have a conversation or can alert you immediately to an event taking place or whatever. You can see things unfold in real time. You think, boy, this sounds amazing. But then the way it's actually turned out, it is so polarizing and tribalistic in the worst possible way that you think, ah, oh, but you know, I mean, I'm so far into it. I can't leave, but yeah, I probably would be a lot happier without it. No, I've, the days, you know, recently with the move and everything, there have been a lot of days where I'll wake up, jump on social media, you know, maybe pop off a bunch of tweets, and then I'm off for hours. And I mean, what, as long as you're doing something, you don't miss it. You know, I mean, we're promoting something. You know, we're promoting the show, promoting a sub stack. You're promoting your newsletter. You're promoting the school of life. Every, I mean, that's what we use it for. Um, also, you know, to try and get the message out there and let people know that they're not alone, that, that, that 
there are people on their side who see that you know this regime is completely insane and um you know you're going to have to find a way to fix it probably in your personal life first and then you can worry about the politics hopefully locally first and then you know move from there but yeah i mean social media re i've i've said it so many times especially in the last year that just I, I wish I didn't didn't never got on it. Now, I know people who haven't been on in like six or seven years. They like abandoned social media six seven years ago, and they're so much happier than I. <laughs> yeah, I, I I absolutely hear that. I absolutely hear that. Uh, but yeah, as you say, I think I am kind of stuck with it. But yeah, it should you know it's but it says something about it says something about mankind that this didn't work out because it mm -hmm. should have worked out. You know, it should have been a great step forward for us as a species to have this kind of communication with each other. And it should have been an opportunity to exchange information and learn. And the fact that it isn't is yet another uh, depressing reminder of how flawed we are. Now, let me, let me say something else related to the, to human beings being flawed. And I'm sorry to be so red pilled here. I'm, I'm or black pilled rather. I'm, I'm, I'm generally not uh, just because my temperament is too cheery for that. But last night at, on my uh, Liberty Classroom site, I did a uh, live Q&A with uh, Professor Jeff Herbener. We were, we were talking about economics. And I just said to him, Jeff, you know, if I were to ask you to, to sum up the state of the economics profession right now, you would probably tell me that it is just shot through with problems, like it's borderline hopeless. But, and then I said to him, what are the chances that economics is the only academic discipline that's like that? You know, I mean, wouldn't that be what, what are the odds that we just happen to be stuck in the worst one? And, you know, may, maybe it's just that instead of being dispassionate truth seekers, human beings have base motives that they bring to everything, including academic investigation. And they want maybe some of them like to be economists because they want to be they want to toady up to power. And being an Austrian economist is not the path to that. You know, maybe that. So some people have base motives or they want. They want the discipline to spit out results that justify their exercise of power. Maybe there's that. Well, so he said, and I, sorry, I was so ignorant. I didn't know about this and I haven't even looked into it since then. So I might be misstating it. But Jeff said about 10 years ago, there was the replication problem in psychology. Now, did you hear about this? That, so the problem know. was researchers started going through published papers and trying to replicate the results in those papers, and they couldn't replicate a damn one of them. Oh, wow. And so it's all been BS. And so what? So where does the discipline stand now? You know, so so, so it's not just that we're too, sh we're too bad of people to be able to make Facebook a pleasant place to be. It's that we can't even be trusted with, like, telling, reciting facts <laughs> anymore. You know, so I... I don't know what to think. I really don't. And, and, and yet I realize the elitism of trying to claim that I, however, am above all this and I am a fearless truth teller. But I don't know, Pete, that is kind of how I think of myself. <laughs> well, when, when you were saying that, it reminded me of, um, I, I'm sure, I, I don't even know who the first person who did this was. It's apocryphal at this point that when they created like the first AI and let it loose, it's within like an, within a day, it's talking about, well, humanity must be destroyed. You, you've heard that, right? It, yeah. I think it's I think it's amazing that social media is created, and within you, you go on within within six months, this person's Hitler, this person's Nazi, a, a Nazi. This person deserves to be dead. This it's just people like the the worst part of people comes out. I'm sure it has something to do with the anonymity, but also you can't you can't only think that everyone on social media is being hyperbolic when it comes to things like that. So it really seems like it makes the worst in people come out. Yeah. So, you know, the question is, do you want your kids on it? Well, if you know, it's no good. <laughs> uh, the, the question answers itself really. And the, the funny thing is when I first got on Facebook, I remember thinking, Oh, this will be cute. When my kids grow up, we'll exchange funny posts together and, you know, the, the world was still that kind of, the, that was still a world where you could put a video up on YouTube and the thought would never cross your mind that it would be taken down. Yeah. 
You know, so in that world, it seemed, oh, that'd be fun. You know, we'll joke with each other on Facebook. No. Yeah. And, th <laughs> and then Twitter comes along and it's like, I mean, it, it almost seems like some kind of experiment, some regime experiment to not only disseminate their propaganda and get it out in front of as many people as possible um, and communicate it to their apparatchiks, but um, a, a way to get people to just go to war with each other. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's now, of course, there are a lot of people like you and me who don't accept the propaganda, but what's really amazing is the way, I mean, you would think the internet, it decentralizes everything. And so there'll be less tribalism, um, you know, in the sense of I have to show everybody that I believe in such, a, you know, because everybody will have their own individual little causes and concerns. But to see the way people around the world immediately know the new signal is hold up the Ukrainian flag, or now it's a pride flag, or now it's a, a, a vaccine, or, or now it's a, everybody just knows this is the thing that I can signal to people that I am on the team. I am on the elite team with the rich and powerful because I am a pathetic individual who needs the approval of the rich and powerful, even though they hate my guts and would kill me in a minute, you know, if, if it benefited them. Yeah. Uh, it's been amazing to observe. So, so I've actually even thought during COVID, I wondered, a part of me thought, thank God we had the internet because then at least we could get some dissident voices out there. And that probably may still be the correct answer. But the compliance, I think, was partly driven by just the ubiquity of the imagery everywhere you looked on your computer and the suppression of alternatives um, made people think, well, I guess everybody's doing this. You know, whereas you weren't sitting there wondering, I wonder what they're doing in France. Well, you knew instantly everybody's wearing a mask in France. And so it made it possible to to get people into this this mentality in a way it, it, it engineered consent to, to use a, a Noam Chomsky in phrase in a way that they might not have been able to do. Uh, quite so readily in the old days. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think it's a toss up now. I'm, I'm not convinced either way what the I mean, yeah, if we'd still had three television networks, that would have been stultifying. But I don't know, maybe maybe resistance would have expressed itself beneath the surface in some other way. I don't know. But I guess my point is, I thought the Internet would be the dream come true for dissident voices. And to an extent, it still is. But to another extent, it can also be a tremendous instrument for enforcing conformism. Mm -hmm. Well, Tom, I still just want to know about those videos of the people in China just falling over and dying in the street. Yeah, what was that all about? Yeah. All right. I want you to do something that you are absolutely the best at. You're the best at many different things. But promoting You're myself is the best? the best at promoting yourself. So <laughs> please go ahead and do that. Okay. All right. Well, you taught me uh, how to, you, I mean, you, you taught me how to do it. Oh, so, thanks, Pete. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Pete. Um, well, I guess the key thing these days, I, I've got a bunch of fun things coming up I'm going to be releasing. But right now, I still strongly urge folks to check out my um, my book, National Divorce. It's in ebook form only. I think it's really good. Uh, chapter one, I really think will knock your socks off. And you'll know more about this than anybody you know. Um, but I actually have it, believe it or not, at nationaldivorce.com. And nationaldivorce.com was owned by some other schmuck. I don't know who. And I, so I couldn't just pay the 10 smackers for it. I had to pay. I had to pay for this thing. So yeah, you told please, me how much you paid for it. And I, and I think you're insane. But that's I right. know. So please, people, <laughs> help me after the fact make this a rational decision and go to nationaldivorce.com and get that book. It doesn't cost you anything. Just go get it. Well, I appreciate it. And um, for everyone tuning in to the Old Glory Club and the crowd is just uh, growing more and more every day. Um, we thank you for coming on and um, appreciate everyone watching this. Thank you.